Hello, my name is No Sweat. Uh, today's January 3rd, 2024. This is another video I'm shooting. We haven't shot a video of my racing homers, my Sions, for about a year and a half now. And I've got a lot of people that have been wanting me to shoot a new video. Uh, as I've done in the past, I'm gonna talk about a lot of different things. Um, there's been a lot of changes that's happened since I've shot my last video. And I'm going to take you through the lofts and show you all the, the new lofts that I've got and what I've done with the birds. And uh, I'm the guy that's had the uh, Sions for 66 years. Uh, I'm the guy that uh, took the greatest family of Sions that were in the United States uh, that were owned by Charles Heitzman. He was world famous. His birds had won races all over the United States as well as in all over the world. His birds flew in World War II in China and represented the United States in, uh, at, in Europe. His son uh, was Charles Heisman Jr. Was, uh, flew those Sions and uh, they were there on D-Day. Uh, it was a long history with Sions. They're one of the most uh, greatest, most venerable uh, strains of families of pigeons that's ever existed. And I've taken that family of birds and over the past 35 years since Heisman's death, I've actually made them better. I'm the one guy that's taken the cream of the actual racing Sions and has turned them into what they are today. I flew in Victoria Falls a few years ago with a small team of birds. Uh, my Sions, my family of Sions, and I want to stress my family of Sions, they round up first United States out of all the pigeons that flew out of Chicago, New York, Miami, wherever it was at, California, all the different people that had pigeons in the United States that entered them in the Victoria Falls race. It was my Sions, my family of Sions that finished first for the United States. No other birds, a family of Sions. I want to stress that. Not only that, I had a hen named Summertime. Uh, her band number is 18162. She'll be, she was flown into the United States uh, yesterday and I'm hoping that I will have her back in my loft breeding here very shortly after she goes back through quarantine. Summertime is a pure Sion out of my no sweat family. Uh, she possibly is the greatest Sion that has been a racer internationally uh, competitive that flew against the best in the world in the Africa Race Series. She was first United States more than once about five different times she led the entire United States and at one point um, one of the races she was fifth out of all the pigeons out of 5,000 birds or so in that particular race she was sixth world uh, so anybody that said anything negative about a family of pigeons or about a Sion they've not done their homework and uh, the best racing Sions today are right here at my lofts they're not not uh, ten dollar birds that I'm marketing off or have photoshopped on some pigeon website and they're not pretty birds that are show birds. These are the actual racing pigeons flying against the best pigeons in the world. There's nobody else in the world that's got Sions that are doing what I've done with them. Um, I want to also mention that these are birds four different times in the last 15 years I've taken them young birds world record long distances. I've taken young birds 700 air miles from these lofts right here and have let them loose and each and every time I got young, some young birds back from 700 miles. This is at a, during an era of racing pigeons when people pray that they get a bird back from 300 miles. The idea that they would get a young bird back from 700 miles, they just don't even think about it. Uh, I believe that if you're going to have great racing pigeons, you want to buy great racing pigeons, you want to find out what a great racing pigeon is, the one thing you look for is which bird has the best homing instinct. You can take all those theories, eye sign, slit throat, fence, back, keel, type of feather, um, wing theories, whether the tail touches the ground, with the head, jerk the head back and take all those things. You want to take all those things into consideration because a lot of people have done observations and see certain birds have won that, but you can throw them all in the garbage because you cannot look at a pigeon and tell how great it is. I've seen birds that look like they're going to win the Kentucky Derby. 
and I've seen birds that look like they're ready to be thrown in the garbage. And it's the bird that looked like it was ready to throw in the garbage. It was the first bird back. Could be that same bird that was your best breeder. I've had that happen to me more than once. I had 40 pair together one time, and I had the worst pair that I put together, two blue checks. That They were just my pair that I was actually going to put other birds. They wound up when I started training the young birds. It was their babies that outflew everybody else's. One thing I want to talk about is that Tony Malucci, he's a very famous pigeon man that uh, lived down in Florida, and Tony and I were really good friends. He just died recently, and he had a huge fan club down there with the Gulf Coast group. Uh, I have nothing but admiration for Tony. There was one year that I, I sent a blue bar down to him, and uh, I sent it. It was a perfect pigeon. Everything on it, all the things that I just mentioned were right there. Vent, back, cover, eye, wing, all that stuff. And both of his parents had flown 600 miles with young birds. All four grandparents had flown 600 miles with young birds. I knew this was going to be a great pigeon. And Tony did said he was filled up, and, and he probably was, but he said, no sweat. I'll take this bird from you as a favor. And so he took the bird, and when he began to fly it, uh, it wasn't coming good for him. And when they flew the last race, the big Gulf Coast race, uh, he lost the bird. I said, Tony, I don't understand how that bird didn't come back. And Tony was so nice. He was uh, such a good, smart pigeon man. And I said, Tony, I did everything right. I, I knew that bird would come back. And Tony said to me, he said, Robbie, no sweat. He said, when you think you know everything about a pigeon, he said, that's when you find out you don't know anything about a pigeon. And I've, uh, I've always admired that statement because there are people out right now on the internet that are saying that a, they've set themselves up as experts because they've had pigeons for a while, 40 or 50 years. Uh, and, and so they all suddenly, they compute that they've, since they've done that and they've been experienced with birds that all of a sudden they become great experts on pigeons. And a lot of those particular people are just out there singing and dancing and do little tap dances for you so they can get your money. They'll tell you, you know, pigeon this. Or you, one of the one of the things they've recently been doing is talk about families of pigeons. You'll never have a great bird out of a family of pigeons. That's the most idiotic statement ever made. Uh, anytime you have a pigeon that flies well for you, uh, let's say you get a bird back from 600 miles on the day. Now let's say you take it back out again the next year, 600 miles on the day, and it wins again. Gary Stone, a real good friend of mine, he had a blue bar, white flight cock, a fantastic Sion that flew 400 miles in the combine up in Cincinnati. It won first on the combine, I forget, a thousand birds. And then uh, they flew it the next week, 500 miles combine. Uh, it was first again. And then 600 miles combine, first again. Four, five, and 600 miles, three weeks in a row, four, five, and 600 miles is Sion, this Heisman Sion wins these three combine races. Now, any good pigeon man would want to try to reproduce that bird back again. They would want that blood. And the way you, the, you go about doing that, generally speaking, is line breeding. If you're a good line breeder, you can try to reproduce that bird again, keep his blood. If you're a really good line breeder, and have sort of a gift with pigeons, you can actually make go after that same blood and make it maybe a little bit better, depending on how you go about putting birds together. But line breeding is, is, is no secret in the sport, and it's the key to success. And if you have a large group of birds, a couple hundred of them, and all of them have been line bred back to certain champions, and you start over a long period of time like I've done, start looking, trying to keep the birds a certain size, a certain face, and a certain feather, and a certain everything together, you develop a family after that. Heisman told me that uh, if you've got all the birds all the birds in one generation uh, is, is one matter, second generation is another matter, third generation, fourth generation. But if you've got a pigeon that were all you bred all the babies, let's say out in five generations, you know, two, four, six, I mean two, four, eight, you know, in 16, 32, and 64, if you bred all those pigeons that were in those 64 birds, and that bird, all those you bred those, then you could kind of put a stamp on it and say that you bred that pigeon and it's your that it's your family of birds. And that's where I'm at with my family now. I mean, all these birds go back 20 generations where I bred every single pigeon in. So that's a, it's a true family. There's not many families in the United States because there's this hype about crossing pigeons all the time. It's a sales pitch. 
It's a it's it's a way they they bring in new cars on the car lot all the time. They want you to cross pigeons. There's very few people who've got the patience or the know-how or the understanding of genetics and how to selectively breed correctly to build a correct family. And that's what you want to do with pigeons. You can't tell me that Van Loon didn't know anything about pigeons. He had a family of pigeons. You can't tell me that Stassert didn't know anything about racing pigeons. He had a family of pigeons. And you certainly can't tell me that Paul Theon didn't know anything about racing pigeons. He had a family of pigeons. Um, when Dr. Anderson, the English uh, pigeon fancier, came to visit uh, Paul Theon, you know, he said that he saw a great uniform type in those birds. When uh, Colonel Osmond went to visit Paul Theon, you know, he said that he said that Theon had won more first places in Europe and more championships in Europe in one year than almost any fancier he'd ever known when in their lifetime. This was with a family of pigeons. I have taken that same family that Paul Sion had, the true pure Paul Sions, the racing Sions, and I, they, Charles Heisman got them before World War II because Paul, uh, Paul Sion died in 1947, and his son Robert went about getting some of the birds back from the French underground, and he also had some birds given back to him from Dr. Anderson in England to help him get those Sions going back again. But that was a different group of Sions, and even though he had success with them, I still don't believe they were quite the homing pigeons and the raising pigeons and had that um, that that special family stamp that the that Paul Sion had on them. Uh, so the birds that came after that, Robert and on, I, I, I look at them as different. They're a little more showy. Uh, they're good pigeons, but I don't think they're like the old hardcore Paul Sions were. Uh, I'm going to get to show you today uh, my new lofts and some of the birds. I want to show you what a true family of racing pigeons like. Well, again, when I talk about sins, I'm not talking about some show birds, and I'm not talking about some junk birds. I'm talking about the very best sins that exist in the world today. So come with me. We're going to start out with, I bought, uh, I bought some containers up in Cincinnati, 45-foot long containers that are nine and a half feet tall, might as well say 10 foot tall, and, uh, and I've moved them out on, I had to buy Five acres, we'll get into that. I've bought five acres of land right here in the middle of Richmond, and I've moved the loft to that. I had to. And uh, come on, we'll take a little tour here for a minute. This is one of the containers. You'll see this chart on racing pigeons. I got it at the uh, at the National Young Bird Show in Louisville this year, where I met uh, Rod Kirstner and Mike Brown and, and some of the really good showmen that are still around today, friends of mine. And uh, uh, right here is your racing homework. You can see all the different breeds of pigeons that there are. And, uh, and it's fascinating. Uh, Charles Darwin loved to race uh, homing pigeons. He loved pigeons in general. He belonged to four different pigeons, but because he saw how you could, this is real important with knowing about homing pigeons. He saw how you could selectively breed, human selectively breed, pick out what you wanted to breed for. If you wanted a pigeon to look like this, you could you could take a pigeon that looked like this and, up here and put them together and start breeding pigeons that looked like this. And, and, and you could get these different different types of pigeons through selective breeding. There's two kinds of breeding. There's selective breeding and natural breeding. In nature, they breed, and they change over a period of time. It's called evolution. But, it, it, but it's a very slow process. It's not like when humans take control. When humans take control of this selective breeding, we're much more quicker to get that because we, we go straight after that, uh, after that particular form that we want, those qualities, those whatever it is we want. So these are human selectively bred birds. They all came from the same bird. Uh, we'll come on through these. With your these are some of the baskets. I've had many more uh, training baskets than these. I had three times as many. I used to show birds up uh, all of the United States. Um, I was the youngest person in the United States to win the National Young Bird Show. Uh, I was 22 years old when I won that in White Plains, New York, back when they used to have a, a really large show of uh, people all of the United States that came there. And uh, very proud of that. Went in that show during that year. Came back again and won it later on. Uh, and I had all the special show crates for that. I want to talk about something about showing and racing. That certain people, there's a lot of things that are good about both that harmonize with both and things that you can learn from both. Uh, but one thing I do want to show you here is this is Paul Sion. This is a basket from Paul Sion himself. This one up on top. 
This is one I got from Charles Hotsman. And uh, Hotsman got that before World War II. I think um, in the 1930s, I don't know what year it was, and I don't know which group of Sions he got in there. Hotsman imported Sions seven times. And four of those times he got them from Paul, and three times he got them from his son named Robert. But this is one of the old Paul Sion original baskets that were that Heisman got his birds in. Had a little repair work there. This basket here, this double wide wicker basket, they used to sell these. You can't hardly find one now. Heaven knows what it cost if you did. But this basket my mother and dad bought me when I was 16 years old, and I, I've loved it and cherished it. When I flew the Lexington Racing Pigeon Club, this is what I brought my birds over. You can put 20 birds on top, 20 birds in the end. All these baskets, all these wicker baskets are belong to Charles Heisman. And Charles Heisman uh, trained his birds. These are these are the old Belgium wicker baskets that all the racing pigeon clubs had in the United States at one time. Were real common. Anytime you went to a club meeting or a combine, that's what they shipped their birds off in, brought their birds in. I cherish them. Now you don't see them very much. Uh, they're starting to really fade out. Any of the wicker stuff has is, is gotten to be hard to get. Uh, but I love these particular baskets. Uh, I got them from Charles Heisman. He kept these underneath his loft, and he kept some of them actually in the uh, uh, in his library. And I want to talk about that for just a second. For anybody that thinks, uh, uh, you know, they know all about racing pigeons, I'd like to emphasize that I'm the person that inherited the, the world's largest pigeon library. And by that I mean all the magazines that were published in uh, England, and uh, in the United States, uh, all the journals and all the books and uh, so much more. I got it through Charles Heitzman. He had the largest pigeon library. He was famous for it. And when he died, I wound up with most of it. And if you go to the, and I've read all of it. So, you know, I have some small idea about genetics with pigeons and about families with pigeons. So it irks me when I see somebody say, you have to be an idiot to have a, a pigeon from a pure family. No, quite the opposite. And, uh, you know, I talked to my good friend Jim Isselhart this last night on the phone, and Jim was a very famous showman in the United States. In his time, he was the best showman in the United States. And Jim was famous for his family of Isselhart pigeons, and everybody recognized those birds, and that family uh, still is prominent in a lot of the shows today, people using that blood. I want to say this about the Sions. Even though somebody might have them that are showy and somebody might have some crummy looking ones that are not very good, they still, there's something about the Sions, and it is very true. I don't know what it is genetically, but that is such a strong uh, gene pool. I, I, I don't know, there's, there's something that comes through year after year with those Sions. Uh, whatever it is that Paul Sion saw, he used the Waggies and some of the other uh, earlier strains, some of the original strains of, of, of racing homing pigeons, the origin of homing pigeons. He put some of those birds together and came up with the Sions. Uh, but these birds really still show that original Sion something about them. I don't know what it is. It's just a, like you taste chocolate in a drink or something. You can still see the Sion in a pigeon. And, and, and some of those guys that I talked about earlier, Dr. Anderson and Colonel Osman, very famous pigeon men in their time, the most famous pigeon men in, in the world in their time, they talked about the Sions uh, having that something about them. A Sion man can spot a Sion a mile away. There is some truth in that. Uh, but I've seen a lot of birds that look like Sions. You know, I might see a bird here that looks like, but when you see a group of Sions together, particularly in my family of birds, you'll, you will see, you'll get to go back and see, my God, this man has taken the very best Sions, racing Sions, that has developed into a family that is now even better than any Sions have ever existed. And I hope to show you that today. Let's come on through here. I'll show you uh, this. This is a crate that belonged to Charles Heisman. I've cleaned it all up. You can see it's still got Charles Heisman's name on it. I hope you can see that. And then this is another crate that belonged to Charles Heisman. And now I put my name on that. But these are two crates that I got from Charles Heisman that he had in his library. Uh, and I've got other, many other crates too uh, that belong to Heisman. Like I was talking about, I, these are just some of the crates. Uh, Heisman was real uh, particular on everything he did. He had an eye for detail. And of course, he loved his. It didn't matter what it was. You know, he had a, he had a loft helper all the time. And 
that guy a lot of time was when you ship birds years ago when you very first started shipping pigeons when I was a teenager we shipped birds by train and I would be in Ravenna Kentucky and we had a depot up there and I would go down to the train station and ship my pigeons out uh, in, in wooden crates and stuff and then they did away with that and then we started shipping pigeons uh, across the United States and every other place started shipping pigeons by air uh, and I would have to go to a different pl uh, air terminal to ship just the animals and stuff. Have to go in there, and we still took shipped them in, in crates and different kind. Then the airplane stopped doing. You know, we couldn't do that anymore. Go to the airport and ship them. And so we were fortunate. To, I don't know who went about doing it exactly, but the ARPU or something. Whoever we was able to manage to get uh, be able to ship pigeons to the post office. And so now that's that's the route that everybody uses. Of course, the, the really early pigeons that were being shipped uh, when Heisman was getting birds and stuff coming out of uh, France from Paul Sion from Tourcoing, they, uh, uh, those 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 birds a lot of time were coming by ship. So it was a big ordeal to have somebody on the ship to take care of the birds to get them to come over. Uh, listen, I'm going to be taking some birds today. I just went in the loft just a while ago, right before we started shooting this, and I caught nine blue bars. Just I just grabbed the first nine that came up. And I grabbed us some reds and silvers. And I'm going to be putting them in these cages for you to look at, these show cages. And I can tell you from as an experienced showman uh, that when you take a racing pigeon, even though my birds are exceptionally tame, and that's what you actually want with birds, you want, them, you want, them, you want good tame birds. But when you start putting them in crates like this for the first time ever, they're probably going to be jumping around in here. I already know it ahead of time before I even do it. So don't be thinking, oh my God, these birds are wild or whatever it is because that's just the nature of a, of, a, of a good racing pigeon. They're going to be butting against this. I know they will. They'll knock the shavings down and everything. And so I know it before I even do it. These birds have never been in a crate like this. So, you know, you, even with your show birds, you want to try to break them and get them, get them used to being in cages, if that's what you're doing. I'm not doing that. I'm just doing this display just to show you guys what the birds look like today. That's all. So don't, don't negatively judge the birds if they're if they're moving around too much in the cage, because that's what a pigeon's going to do this first time, particularly a good racing pigeon. Uh, again, I, you know, talking about shows, uh, one thing that I was real proud of, uh, really the pigeon show in the United States when I was showing that had the most entries in the United States was the SRPA show. Uh, it was the Southern Racing Pigeon Association show, and it really generally uh, had the, the 13 southern states in it made it up or that or that area of it and i it was a large show a lot of times have as many as seven eight hundred thousand pigeons in it uh and had racing uh, and and the non flowns and i showed at that show seven times and i won that show seven times there was no person ever in the history of the srpa that won that show seven times running straight like it. it's the only time i showed it i judged the show several times and uh, so I'm very proud of that. If, I, if anything else in, that I ever did in showing uh, was to win that. Of course, I, I was the very first person in the United States ever to win all three of the major uh, shows in the United States all in the same year. I won the National Young Bird Show in Louisville when it was a show that used to have 700 birds and so forth in it. Then I went up to New York and won that show. And then I came back and won the SRPA show all in the same year. Uh, you have to know a lot about pigeons to do that, even if it isn't showing. And that's one of the things I want to talk about is knowing weights on pigeons. If you're going to race pigeons, you need to have a computer running in your head all the time. Long before the race, you're going to have to take that pigeon and feel of it all week long, maybe two weeks, for the two, and, and be constantly, you don't have to handle it a lot, just maybe at roost at night, just pick him up and send him back down. Just kind of get a mental picture of what kind of weight the majority of the birds are carrying because you can't get all your birds all the time that all handle exactly alike. But you can get the majority of them too. So if you're going to fly a 500 mile race and you know it's going to, going to be shipping for two days to get them down there or they're going to be in crates and this and that, you've got to think in your mind how much weight is that bird going to lose over two days before when it's let loose. And, and then if it's a 500 mile race, how long is it going to take them to come back? And you should know at that time. Are you going to have tailwinds, headwinds? Is it going to be raining that day? You're, you're going to be watching the weather. If you're a good pigeon man, you're going to be looking at every little thing that's going on about that race way, way ahead of time. You always stay ahead of time on all this stuff. And so 
you try to figure your weight out on the pigeon. If it's a long distance race and you're going to be, going to be cooped up for a few days, you want to put, you want to send that bird off with a lot of weight on it because by the time it gets loose, let loose and has to fly back and burn those calories up coming back, it's going to need some weight on it. It's going to need some uh, to get back. If you send a bird, it's uh, you know in what you think is in perfect condition to fly right now, you're probably making a mistake. It's probably going to be too light, and not have enough energy. It may come back, but it may not come back as fast as it would have if it would carry the right, right, right amount of weight. So you've got a clock going on in your head all the time. Same thing with showing. I talked to Rod Kirstner just the other day on the phone, and we talked about this thing, and I talked to Jim Inselhart. All these show guys know that. I, when I used to go to New York, it was a two-day drive for me to get up to New York, and then the show took two days. You'd have to enter them and then judge, and they go through the finals and everything. So I had to figure out my mind what my bird's going to weigh like in four days but when that, when that judge picked it up. Because if you've got your bird fat, a lot of birds will have a tendency to open their back, open their vent, and if they, but when they start to lose that weight, they'll tighten up. And or they'll, even, the body, the, even the body weight will change sometimes. It'll get more, like a, it'll, be a, it'll have a different consistency about it, like balsa wood or whatever they want to call it. It has a, a lighter feel to it than when you've got something that's more muscular. And so, again, it, it, and that's why some, a lot of your good showmen today, and, I, and as always, a lot of those good showmen were earlier at some point in their life probably good racing pigeon men as well. I know Douglas McClary was, Jim Isselhart was, uh, I think Paul Anderson was, I think Dick Lipsky was. A lot of, a lot of guys that were some of your top uh, showmen, including myself, uh, were, were very good racing pigeon men, knew all about how to f race pigeons. And they, it was because they had an eye for detail, and it was because they knew how to condition birds, and then they applied that not only in racing, but then they turned right around and do it in showing as well. So there's a... There's, there's it's real important to understand weights with birds. You just don't pick up your bird out of your loft and ship it off to a 100 mile race and not take that into consideration if it's a 100 mile race or a 500 mile race or is it going to be in the crate one day or is it going to be in the crate two days. You've got to be figuring those things in your head and figuring how much weight it's going to lose and so, and so forth. It's a little thing. But here, let's, let's walk on back. Here's some of the aluminum crates that they've got now. You know, that's become real popular. Uh, and then these are crates kind of an ear. It's funny how the crates go through eras. You know, they really used to be seeing these kind of crates. And now you've seen a lot of the aluminum crates. And, uh, and like I said, the wicker basket for the old crates. I want to show you something here just for a second. Right here. These, these are, this little thing right here. Uh, this is a, a mink trap. Uh, one of the worst things that's happened to me with pigeons over the last uh, 20 years is two different times I've had mink attacks. Uh, minks have come up off the creek and come up into the pigeon lofts during the winter time, both times, and um, of course they'll kill every bird in your loft if they get a chance. And a mink's a tough devil to get, he's smart. But if you've got one of these boxes, you cut a little hole here, and you put your traps on the inside, dead fish or one of the pigeons he's killed or something. So when he goes through this hole to go back in there, you've got a door on the back side, you've got your traps in there. He can't hop around and miss not getting stepped on by trap. And that's what your professional guys that catch minks, they have traps similar to that right there. So that's a, those are mink traps. I only use that if one gets in my loft and kills, you know, hundreds of birds. This is this year's pigeon bands. You know, uh, oh my God. All right, anyways, <laughs> these are the KY bands. I want you to see the KY. And uh, what I did, hang on, I didn't know they were on the string like this. Uh, I thought they were down there. Anyway. Anyways, I did the same thing that Charles Heisman did. You know, if, if, if this year's uh, 2024, so I've, I've got my band starting out 2400, AU 2024, KY, and then they start at 2400. So I know looking at the 2400, that's a 2400, you know, year. Uh, and, uh, and I start out with one. And, there's a hundred bands here, so I know you know the first bird, second bird that hatched that year. That's a picture of my grandson right there when he was five years old, going through California Cave. He was the youngest guy ever to go in that cave. It's a real tough cave to go through. And here's my grandson now at 22 years old. This is 17 years later, and he's still with me. And uh, he takes care of the birds a lot when I'm not taking care of them. He feeds and waters them and bands the babies and does all the things that I do. Everything in between. And everything in between. His name's Lance. He had straight A's this last semester in college. Something like that. So I was 
pretty happy about that. He's a swimmer and a scuba diver and a surfer and does all, a lot of the stuff that I do. Uh, so he's going to be with me today. Uh, so grandfather and his grandson, kind of an interview, along with Jeremy's doing the, the, uh, the video. And uh, Jeremy's the one who shot the last several video, and I've had a lot of people that's complimented uh, his, his videos. I get my bands around in, you know, in, uh, right before Christmas in December. And that's what uh, that's what we all use, you know. Everybody in the American Racing Pigeon Union, we all use these same bands, these same seamless bands. But you know, they're issued to each person individually. I see one. Yeah. Yeah. Let's walk on through here. I want to so I want to tell you all, you know, anybody that looks at my website, which is the Heitzman Sion website, uh, I've had over three million hits on that website. I'm not too sure that many people have had over three million hits on a website on a pigeon website. Uh, I like to think that it's, it's one of the most popular. But I have lots of pictures on there, and I get a lot of people that compliment me on the photographs. I don't do any Photoshop, and you know, if you go on certain pigeon auction websites and, and other things, uh, advertisements in pigeon magazines, you see where people have done Photoshop and their tails and their wings all come back exactly alike. They're all standing exactly like a statue. I don't do that stuff. It, it, it's not real. And uh, I want to be real with the birds. But I take pictures with the, uh, this, this particular camera. I do a lot of underwater photography. I shoot about 40,000 underwater photographs every year. I'm doing an underwater uh, book for Mercer University. I hope that they'll be the ones that publish it. I just came out with, uh, and that particular book's going to be impressionistic uh, photographs of fish. It's going to be like Van Gogh got turned loose in underwater. Uh, where's my book at? I just came out with a book. Uh, in October, a new book that I've spent a big part of my life working on. It's uh, about an eight-year project. It's called Uncle Moses and Ed Hawkins, and you see it's by No Sweat, and that's where the No Sweat comes from. It's my pen name. I've been writing under No Sweat for almost 50 years. Uh, I'm hoping that this book will go beyond just being a book. Uh, you can find this book on Amazon, and eventually it'll be on all, all, your, all the different sites that, that, that sell books, uh, Barnes and Noble and everything, it's, it just takes a while to work its way up through there. It just wants to release. But it's, it's always been my dream to have a book that works its way into being a, a movie. I was raised over top of a movie theater, and, uh, and my grandfather had two, two movie theaters, and he also had the drive-in, and, and I used to run the projectors and order the movies and do all that kind of stuff. And so um, uh, it's my dream to, to have a movie. Hopefully this is a Western. And it's based on the, on, the, on the life of the first man who was legally hanged in eastern Kentucky. His name was Ed Hawkins. And you can find Ed Hawkins' confession on the Internet. Just type in Ed Hawkins' confession. You'll, you'll see how interesting his life was. I fell in love with, it, with, his, life, with his confession, and I developed it into a novel. Uh, I'm, an old, I'm one of the old, old guys in the sport now. I never thought I'd be there, but I, you know, after, I started with pigeons in 1958. Uh, I've got pictures of me with racing homers with Sions in 1958. I got my first Sions from Charles Heitzman in 1959. I've got a friend named John McQuithy in Indiana uh, that's been friends with me with pigeons since 1959, and Gary Stone up in Cincinnati since the 1950s. So they're, they're two of my oldest pigeon friends that are still alive, and that's one of the great things about being in the pigeon sport is, is having a friend that's been in the sport with you that long. That, knows not only your pigeons but knows the rest of you, all about you. I'm one of the guys in the pigeon sport that doesn't have a tattoo and I've got a cell phone. Robert E. Lee was the last one to use his cell phone. He, uh, he surrendered to Grant on his cell phone. My turns were a mini ball, ricocheted off of it. We'll walk on through here just for a minute. I just want to show you a few things as we walk by. Uh, for some of you younger guys that have never seen these type baskets, I'm sure you have, but they had a divider in the middle of them, and they had the... Lance, can you undo this? Can you undo this? My fingers. It's cold out here today. I'm not... It's right at freezing, so... Uh, well, it's just on there real hard. But anyway, they have a divider in them, that's all, and they had a place to water them, so you could put the cocks on one side and the hens on one side. That's the way a lot of the, it was pretty cool to be able to do that back, you know, back then. Uh, we'll walk on by. I bought some new waters because I have a lot of them that break and freeze up and get dirty and everything else. You know, I got those at the National Young Bird Show this year. This is an Avery, another 
I've got that I'm doing one of the loss. And these are breeding pins that I, because I'm, you'll see what I'm talking about as I go on through. I've, I've had to do a lot of change now, so I've got a lot, this is a supply room right now for me. And so these are breeding cages here. Put on back in here. Uh, not too much yet to talk about. Just some shipping boxes. The ship birds, the, I ship birds all over the world. Uh, I'm the same guy that won the, uh, one of the biggest races in China with my family of racing pigeons not too, uh, uh, several years ago, a thousand kilometer race where they had to fly across, I don't know which river and up into the snow-capped mountains and everything else. Again, with a family of pigeons, uh, all line bred back to basically uh, certain individual pigeons, in, in that case, Leroy. Uh, a family of pigeons that were pure Sions won the thousand kilometer race in China uh, for me, uh, flying against 3,000 pigeons. Same family of birds that won the Tenerife Island where they had fly out across the water and then flew against thousands of pigeons right out of the Sion family, the same family I've got right now today. So it kind of irked me to hear somebody say a bird won't win, you know, it's out of a family. You're like, what? You know, and, and, and it, it, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't, don't want a line breed, you know, you don't, you don't got to cross pigeons, you got to cross them, got to cross them, got to keep them cross. You got to cross them if you want to try to make money selling crosses. And yeah, yeah, you sell them crosses. Sell them all day long. Buy a bird over here, buy a bird over here. I got you a bird over there. I got you here. You know, I got a bird up underneath my leg. I got one underneath my arm. I'll pull one out of my shirt. Here, I got, I got, look at these. We'll cross them all up. You're going to win. <laughs> uh, but you'll see when I ship birds, as a rule, I try to, I try to put a lot of ventilation in them. These are the boxes that you're supposed to ship in, post office, but, uh, I get uh, Richmond Post Office lets me get sometimes ship birds a few at a time in these boxes. So I, and a bird has to have a lot of air when they're being shipped. You want a good deep fresh litter, and you want a lot of air in it, and you don't want you want birds to have a good space ratio when you ship birds because you're probably going to be in those crates at least two days, sometimes three. I've had them go four. That's not good, and it's not good to ship birds in hot weather. You know when it starts getting up. Uh, 82 degrees or something or any more than that. It, gets, it can get dangerous on shipping birds if they have to stand on the box for three days. Uh, we're going to start showing you some of the blue bars there. we got some of the, my Sion's. Most of these blue bars go back. Give me one at a time, please. Man. Most of these blue bars. Uh, 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 uh. We're going to talk about one bird at a time. And we're going to talk, uh, I want to show what birds in a family. My birds are fat right now. I want them fat because we're in January in Kentucky. It's the single coldest month of the year, February being the second coldest month. And we will be getting some ice and snow and stuff. But we reach sometimes 20 below zero. And these pigeons will have to go through it. And in this particular little valley, I've got the lofts in right now, it gets even a little colder here along the creek and the way of wind blows. So you're talking with wind chills and everything else. They can get majorly cold. So these little birds need to carry a lot of weight on them. So I'm tickled to death they're fat right now. This is a very typical bird of my blue of my family. That head, that look, that size. Now I don't know how this bird's gonna act when I put it in the I'll tell you one little secret about this bird without me even look to see who it's out of. Anytime you see that I've taken one of these old metal bands, these are the bands we used back in the 60s and 70s and 80s. They quit making those bands, and I still have a few of them. But if you see me put one of those bands on one of these pigeons as a young bird, that means it's, without me, when I walk in the loft, I don't have to look up who it's out of. There. I know instantly that it's an extremely special bird for me, simply because it's carrying one of those 50-year-old bands on its leg. This bird has that, so we'll put it up here. We, we get them all in, and I will show you kind of what family looks like. Because you're not going to be seeing families of pigeons in the United States, any other place. There are no families, no sweat seons. Uh, this is it. Now, see, I don't know how. It's not acting too bad right now. One of the things that uh, uh, Osmond talked about on uh, Colonel Osmond when he talked about going to Paul Seon's loft, 
he said the pigeons looked big uh, when he, you know, they were uniform to top. But he said when they, uh, actually when he held them, they didn't handle big. So, but these birds right now today, carrying this extra weight, they are, they are handling uh, big because of that weight. Again, you can look at this head on it. Just showing basically the type. We're looking at size and type. You'll see a variation of eyes. Sion's uh, Sion's uh, best pigeon that he that he loved the most was a strawberry mealy cock. He said that it had a black eye, but he said actually when he put it in the light, he called it a blue eye. And, uh, and I really think it was probably a, a, some version of a, what they call a violet eye. A lot of people, when you've got violet-eyed pigeons, uh, they do look black, depending on how the eye, how the eye reflected the color, the light hits that eye. They do look black, but they're not black. Uh, they're usually a violet-colored eye. And uh, this particular hen, see, I know these birds, but because she's a duller blue, not that she's a dull blue, but just a little darker shade blue, and because she's got this. What was it? This one little white tick right here behind the eye. This is a granddaughter of Chattanooga. And that was a bird that flew back from Chattanooga that was hurt and then flew back uh, as a young bird and then flew back as a yearling from 600 miles covered in oil. And uh, that blood has been really, uh, really good blood. There's been some guys that's won with that blood in Texas at five and six hundred mile races. Now the bird I'm getting back from Africa, summertime, one eight one six two. Uh, she's going to look exactly like these birds. I haven't. You know, I've never handled it summertime since the day she left the loss and come back. So she's going to be just like these birds. But you know, there's not been a sea on like her. Uh, people can talk, well, I've got a bird, a Sion, that did this and that. There's nobody that's got any Sions that flew internationally uh, against uh, thousands of pigeons from, you know, against Koopman in the Netherlands and against Kloss in Germany and against Mike Gaines right here in the United States, against the best of the best of the best in the world, and it beat them all, you know. There's not been any Sion do that. My Sions are doing that, you know. So... Here again, you can see that family type. If you've got an eye for type, you can start to see it. You can see he's got his mouth a little bit open. They're carrying too much weight on him right now with me handling them. But the birds are a lot tamer than I than I thought. I thought they might be going up against the case. I'm happy to see that. Oh, like I, see, I told you, generally speaking, a lot of birds will be beat, beat the button against them. Okay, when you do get a chance, Jerry, I want you to, once we get all nine of them, be blue bars. I just picked nine out because I had nine crates. This hen, a gorgeous hen. You can see she's got a little lighter eye, a little what you call a, a violet eye, but it's that you know that lighter colored eye. A lot of those birds do well in uh, races nowadays. Heisman wasn't big on keeping that lighter colored eye. Uh, I like, I like it. This isn't a really light one. In fact, this is this is a version of a violet eye. Uh, I had one guy one of the videos shot. I was picking birds in a breeding cage, picking them up. Some guy commented, "I didn't know how to handle birds." Well, I was probably handling birds 50 years before that guy was born, and uh, I, I don't know. I tried to estimate one time in my life how many pigeons had I picked up in my life. Talking about shows and lofts and everything, you know, I probably picked up close to a million pigeons, a million in my lifetime. I, Somewhere along the line, I think I've learned how to pick up a pigeon. And some people do know how to handle birds, and some don't. And uh, 
it's just a, I don't know. It comes with experience a lot of times. Yeah, this bird's been, they've been fighting each other in there a little bit. He's got a little pick on so You told me they were going at each other a while ago. But can you see this face? It's starting to develop on the birds. It's kind of a, I won't call it a wedge face, but is there, there's a symmetry that goes from the point of the beak up to the crown of the head, above the eye. It's a straight line. It's one of the things that I kind of look for in a family. Cause when you look at a racing pigeon, it's like looking at people a lot of times. One of the things you first look at is look at their face before you start to look at everything else. And, uh, uh, and, and in that family of birds, the birds are all going to have faces that are pretty close to each other. Uh, when you come around here, after we get these nine up here, you'll start to see what I'm talking about. But I could go through the loft and pick up any birds I've got. They're all going to fall into this because it's a family. Through the quarter spur. He's getting a, he's starting to get just a little age on him. You see, see his waddle starting to waddle up a little bit. My birds won't start to waddle up like that until usually uh, at least the third year. What year is that? Say 221. Mm -hmm. It's three. He's gone on three years old, and he's just now starting to develop his waddle. A gorgeous pigeon. You know, there's a lot of old timers. They love the heavy waddle pigeon, and, and I kind of do too. You know, you walk into a law, and you know. Everybody knows it. When you walk to a loft and see somebody, a pigeon that's all waddled up, that's probably going to be one of the guy's best birds because there's, he wouldn't have kept that bird 10 years or 15 years or whatever it was unless it wasn't something very special about it. It's probably it was a good racer and probably a good breeder as well. And that's why he's kept it that long. You know, the oldest dog in the world was 34 years old. The oldest cat in the world, 38 years old. And the oldest pigeon in the world, racing pigeon, is 32 years old. His name was Kaiser, born in 1917 in an army, in a military loft, and died, I think, at Fort Mon Monmouth or something else, also in the military. He was 32 years old. He was a beautiful red chick. Looked just like one of my seons. Uh, but normally pigeons don't live to be 32 years old. But this is a gorgeous pigeon. You know, there's a, almost a universal. I, want, I, I can't hardly put my thumb on it, but there's a... It doesn't matter what they are, what which, which pigeon it was, a Vandaloon or a Stasser or, or whatever it is, all the great races. They'll, some certain ones just have a look. And you know what I'm talking about. It's the eye sears and the waddle and the sheen on it and the look that's got a face that everybody loves. And this bird is one of those kind of pigeons. It's almost a universal pigeon. I love these guys that are experts on pigeons. And they'll be like this. <clears throat> I got this pigeon in my head here now. And uh, let's see. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you all about this bird. Let's see, I'm pulling a wing out here. Mm-hmm. He's got ten wing feathers. Mm-hmm. And let's see, he's got some tail feathers. And let me see, look down the throat. Yeah, he's got a big throat. And he's got tight vents. Oh yeah, he's got some tight vents. And uh, that's a good bird. And uh, so I think I know all about pigeons now. Uh, I judge this bird. That's a good one. Ah, that's a good bird. I love those guys. You, you see a million of them on these videos. They're all pulling the wing out. Look at the tail, isn't it? And then they tell you they're experts. The truth is, you can't tell if it's a great racing pigeon by handling it. You can get some idea. You know, it's not a, it's a, something that's going to fall apart completely. Like I said earlier, when we first started this video, a lot of times you'd be surprised. It might be that little ugly duck that turns out to be your best bird. <laughs> Oh, you calm down. I like when they talk to you like that. Oh, you. She's must. telling me I don't know how to hold her. <laughs> well, she's, the wing's got a little bit messed up in there. Look here on this leg. That tells you everything real quick again. What I say about the aluminum band without me ever having to. I don't know anything about this pigeon right this second. Because I'm, so much of my family look alike. I know if I was in the loft, I'd stand back and look at them again and see what part of the loft are in. I know my bird's in a little bit better. But just pulling her out right this second. I, I, I know automatically she's got that aluminum band on. That's all I need to know. We'll get them over here and we can get a, a good look at them. You'll see what the Robbins family looks like. And last but not least, I don't know who's grabbing This is talking to him too. 
of the hand. I'll tell you something about this hand. This is the hand that J.W. had. Uh, super friend, been a really good friend of mine, lives in North Carolina. If it wasn't for J.W., I wouldn't have even had this pigeon set up that I've got right now. He helped me while I was in Florida. I had to come up with some extra money uh, to pay to the auctioneers and stuff in a certain amount of time, and he came through for me on the whole thing, and he's just been a fantastic person for me uh, and continues to be. He's the one that's helped me get summertime back in the United States. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be able to get summertime back in the United States. He, he's been so good to me. Uh, I, he's an angel that's been sent down. Every now and then in the pigeon sport, you'll, you'll wind up meeting some guy like that, and he's been one for me. And this is a bird that he got back. I, I flew this bird in Africa. This bird went through the entire race series in Africa. And after she flew, he bought the bird back. And we had it imported back in the United States. That's why it's got the two particular bands on it. Anytime you see one of my birds, it's got that big band. It's a bird that flew in Africa and came back from Africa. So it's one of my African pigeons. And I know that I think this bird finished in the top 300 on the last race, you know, out of the original 7,500 birds or what it was that they started with. Very typical of my family of birds. Look at that head. I mean, I, to me, that's gorgeous. That, that, that look, these are these are the seons that get the job done. These aren't show birds, and these aren't scum birds. This is the real deal. This is where the seons are today in the world. This is 2024. These are the top seons now in the world. Period. You, you'll come over here. I look like that at the shows. You can just kind of go around to kind of get an idea of the family. You'll see slight variations of the birds. At the same time, you see that they are a general, the same size birds. Uh, the same demeanor. These birds have never been in a show cage in their life and look out the I'm really surprised at that. I, I was apologizing for them in advance. You were worried about it. Well, I was worried that they would start butting against it because I've seen so many homing pigeons do that. But you'll see these are these are exceptionally nice birds. They're only like the same. The same you step back, almost come back here. You know, I'm, I'm real proud of the way they're acting right now. They're showing you how, just how tame these birds really are. You can't see much through that cane still. <laughs> You know, if you're judging pigeons, I was talking, like I said, I was talking to his old last night, and he said, when you judge pigeons, you know, if you're the judge, uh, and I've judged just about every show in the United States at one time in my life, uh, if you're judging pigeons, you're only going to please one person, and that's very true. You're going to please that guy one. You're going to have all these, all these other guys that say, hey, you know what he was doing? He didn't have that pigeon right. He, know, blah, blah, blah. he wanted the big bird. He wanted the little bird. He, he wanted the racing bird. He didn't want the... You know, you're always going to have that guy. So, you got one guy that loves you, and that's the guy that you, know, you get back to show to. And I had a put these up. I'll put these up quick. I just want to, I'm going to start putting them back up again. I'm just kind of giving you a second look at some of the birds. That's all. You know, Lance is going to take them down and put them back in the loft while we start, and then he'll come back. I think. I'm tired of being cooped up. I think this is Summertime's brother. Pretty sure it is. He had some green paint on him because I painted the loft green. And I'm one of the world's worst painters. Oh, quit that. Hold on. You want to try to get his eye? I can't. But it, it's, it's not getting good light. You really need to get. I oh, quit. Hold on. <laughs> I, hold I couldn't get all of them either. And it's not good light here. You really can't see these eyes. Oh. Easy. Why don't you go put him up? They're definitely fat. But I'm, I'm definitely happy that they are fat. There's a beautiful people. You know, and I love, I love these eye sign guys. 
Uh, I'm not big on life science. Oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Yeah, that's right. I don't know what I'm talking about. Cornell University didn't know what they were talking about when they did scientific studies on life science either. But uh, <clears throat> I've never met any ice sign guy. If I was to put these nine pigeons right here that I had, and I bring in all the ice sign experts, all of them, bring them all in and fill this whole place up, have 20 of them, 50 guys, and say, okay, guys, all you ice sign guys, I've got nine pigeons here. I'm going to take these birds out 200 miles day after tomorrow. It's going to be sunny sky. We're going to have tailwind. I want. I just want you to look at your eyes now. You're all eye sign experts, and tell me which of these birds is going to be the first bird back home, based on their eyes. Now, if they all select the same bird, which I doubt that they would, but if they all select that same bird, and we take them 200 miles, and we let them go, and that one bird they picked out comes back, I might start believing in eye sign. I've not seen nobody do that. Like I said, I've been doing this for almost. 70 years. I see these ice on guys that when a bird does come back from a race, after it's come back from a race, they go, oh, no wonder it won that 200 mile race. Well, look at that eye. Look at that eye. You know, hell, it's got it's got whatever, they, you know, a 200 mile in the sunshine with tailwind eye needs to have. After the fact, not before. Easy, easy, easy. That was the bird in the front of that. Um, yeah. The birds are all molted through right now, of course, in January. Mm -hmm. There's still some people that are showing birds this time. I love this hen. This is probably my favorite, one of my favorite pigeons that I show. Very typical of what I breed toward. The face, eye, demeanor. He's a real nice, 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 nice pigeon. This is, this is Chattanooga, but another thing you look on the Chattanooga blood, see those little white feathers in the rump. Chattanooga, she carried that white feather in the rump. She threw that a lot. And Chattanooga's uh, nest mate, I flew in the AU convention race when it was in Boston and finished like sixth up there in that race. Uh, and they had a, it was a really tough race that year. Here, do me a big favor, Lance. Take all these birds, leave that on there. Take them back. Open that, open, take them all the way inside the, the, the loft, the blue bar loft. My grandson, Lance, just got through taking the blue bars back to one of the lofts. And now we're going to go further ahead from this uh, bench and silver. Just, I didn't bring, I just, this is just a sample of the birds. We just went in there this morning and a few of them. But I'm going to, now these reds, uh, I've got a group of reds going to China or Taiwan this uh, in the spring. Uh, 12, 12 old birds going to a really nice man over there that got some of my silvers last year. And uh, he loves these brick reds. And so does Jimmy so hard and so does a whole lot of people that I respect. Uh, they love this dark, we call them brick reds because they look, it's supposed to be the color of a brick. And uh, I'm not seeing a lot of brick reds of this quality. You'll see somebody around that has a brick red or a dark red. But now it's one thing to have a color. It's another thing to have the whole package. Uh, you know, I want to talk about one thing that I forgot to say a while ago. Was I've been in the sport for 66 years. And I know there's some guy that there's probably been in the sport 70 years or 80 years. You know, if they get much more than that, they're dead. And, uh, but one thing that I have seen in the sport since the 1950s versus the 1920s, 2020s, that I've seen a, a slow process and evolution of the guys love the birds in the 1950s and the 1960s. They, they, there was a camaraderie in the clubs, uh, there was in the combines, we had fraternity races back then. Uh, that was the big thing. You know, a, a combine would put on a, a big special race, a Black Hawk fraternity, or a Twin City Gold Band fraternity, or 
whatever fraternity it was, Waldo Hodgkiss fraternity. Waldo and I were real good friends. I won the Waldo Hodgkiss fraternity. I won the Black Hawk fraternity. I, I finished uh, fourth, first out of area and fourth overall in the Twin City Gold Band fraternity. That was in 1971 with Louis DeMayo uh, was my handler. And I set a state record at that time in Minnesota. It was the most money ever won by anybody uh, in that state with a racing pigeon. <coughs> I was on the swim team at that time. This is one of my reds. Most of my reds go back to 051. Charles Heisman loved that bird. It was his icon red pigeon that he had on all of his advertisement. Uh, I, I just continuously get compliments on these reds. Uh, and I've continued to try to breed a, a really a darker red. You don't know just how good a, you are at anything. I thought I was the greatest swimmer on the face of the earth when I was in high school. Uh, you know, I was swimming right at state record times, and uh, I, nobody could beat me when I swam against them. But when I got in college, I found out I was nothing. I was the worst swimmer on the team. Out of uh, 18 guys, I was the 18th guy. And, uh, and, it, and it, I went from being a big fish in a little pond to a little fish in a big pond. And same thing with colors. Uh, you may think you have a brick red or a really nice blue bar or silver bar that's outstanding. It's until you start having another hundred of those brick reds around you or another hundred of those blue bars around you, if you're just color looking. And so I, I was talking like again to a showman on the phone the other night, and he said, well, I've got brick reds. And I thought, no, you don't have brick reds like what I'm talking about. And there are a lot of variations of brick reds. There's orange brick reds, almost yellowish looking brick reds. There's purplish looking brick reds. And then there's these type of brick reds and there's brick reds that even go much darker than this it's like a black mixed in with the red and sometimes it is a black chick mixed with the red that gives it and that's how you go about getting those darker reds if you mix a brick red with a, a black chick or black velvet you're probably going to have all black toenails instead of white toenails you're probably going to have a black beak that's going to be a darker beak than that and it's going to give the bird i don't know it's, it's almost outlining a pigeon just like you're, you're coloring something and you take a and outline the color. It's, it gives it, it makes it jump out a little bit more a lot of times when you mix that black in with the red. Anyway, this is a little one of my red cocks. Very typical of the Heitzman and very typical of the Seons because a lot of the, a lot of the old line Seons have what they, they talk about that looked like their head was dipped in powder. They even have a word for it in France uh, where it looks like the red was dipped down in powder and the head's got a little lighter color to it than the rest of the body. But it's a typical one of my reds. Color-wise, silver. Lance has got one of my silvers. Now, greatest bird that Sion flew was a silver with the dark eyes. And I'll tell you, if you go back to look at it, in fact, you can go on the internet, and there's there's a gentleman there that's got a a, a YouTube video. It's called the, the History of Sions, for whatever it's worth. And uh, it's a, he shows a picture over and over and over again of the most famous Sion that Paul Sion liked. And if you want to see what that bird looked like in life, right there it is. This is a very typical classic Sion that's held up over the years. Uh, people who think of Sions from years past uh, in the 50s and 60s, um, a lot of times they're thinking of this pigeon. This is a, this is a, this is one of those birds that carries that genetic trait that's stamped in there that it's that has just come through over over a long period of time. Still that same sea on, you know. And they they're a, they're a beautiful pig, and that's what everybody loves that bird because it's got that it's got that apple body and that wedge face, and yet a great racing pigeon too. He's got a little it's a red hen. Yeah particular red hen. She's not super dark red. I love this bird. She's almost got a lace pattern. A lace pattern is where you've got symmetrical checkering on the coverts of the, of the wing on the shoulders. And you'll generally not get a breed of a lace unless you've got a lace to work with. If you go to a pigeon show, you'll see where those pattern, that, that checker pattern is symmetrical all the way down through there, just like you draw lines through it. That's called a lace pattern. And she doesn't have a lace pattern, but she has a very fine start almost like a lace that you'll see. This particular hen, she messed her tail up a little bit in the cage. 
This particular hen's out of a light red chick cock I've got. It's the only lighter red chick cock. He's not light red chick. He's just a plain red chick. But in my loft, I call him light because he's so much lighter than the brick reds. And I call him Jim. I named him that because Jim is a lot like that bird. And I would like him too. He's got a face that's a universal, good-looking sea on face. And this, he raised his hen this year. And she is so classic, old-time Sion. If you want to look at what Sions look like that, that Paul Sion had, they weren't that wedge face like I've been talking about, like I had with those blue bars. They had much more of this kind of face. They had more of a, of a dip in here, more of a common-looking head, a snappier-looking face. This is much more what a, a true old-time Sion looked like. If you and I'm the guy that's got all the old original Sion photographs, all the old original Paul Sion correspondence. I'm the guy that knows what those old Sions look like. This is what they look like, and a lot of them were this color. If you wanted to go to Paul Sion's loft and pick out a pigeon, this is probably what you would have been handling. And again, that's how strong that Sion genetic stamp is. It's come back out. You know, he started those birds in 1892 or something, right around the turn of the century, a little bit before. So we're talking over a hundred years ago. Here comes those Sions right back out again. You know, which is to me is, is pretty fantastic. Show you the strength of a great family of pigeons. If you was to take all the first placements that the Sions have won, it would smother any first places by any so-called champion other pigeon that's ever any individual pigeon that's ever won. No contest. For 40 years in the United States, the Sions dominated the entire uh, short distance, middle distance, long distance, flying over water, flying through the mountains, flying across the desert, flying every week, flying slow races, fast races. And you know, that's another thing. I, the one thing that I did want to talk about, the difference in 66 years ago and today was not only the love of the birds, but the, the sport has turned into money. It's gone from nothing but about uh, having fun with pigeons, but now trying to make money off of them. And they, they're, they're, I've never seen so much advertisement, so much uh, myths on, so much fallacy, so much uh, wrong stuff. Everybody's saying and doing anything they can to sell a pigeon. And, uh, and that's, where, that's where the sport has wound up. It's gone down a rabbit hole. And it's gone down to these one-loft races. Uh, you know, for me, I believe a one-loft race, for the most part, is a raffle. Uh, and I, there's, there's a reason why some of the top flyers in the United States and like Koopman, like different people, enter 50, 60, 70, 80 birds in a race. If it wasn't a raffle, what, what, why, why couldn't they enter just one bird, maybe two birds? I'd have to enter 60, 70, 80 pigeons. At $1,000 a bird by the time it's all the, all the payments made. And so you, you're going to be out to 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars to enter the pigeon race? It, is it not a raffle? The only time that I see that it's not a raffle is that when it happens to be during all those training tosses and during all those races, when all of a sudden you start seeing one bird coming back consistently ahead of all the other pigeons. He's always up in that top 10%, always up in that top 5%, over and over and over again. Then you start to think, hey, even if this is a raffle, you got one bird in there that's really starting to come to the top. And, that, and I, if I was going to be interested in, 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 you know, a pigeon to see how well it is in one of these one-loft races, I would put much more emphasis on the bird that they call, what, the ace bird, a bird that consistently flies well. I think there's much more validity and the quality of a pigeon that consistently flies well in those one-loft races than a bird on a given day that flies the last race. Uh, I think any bird can win that. And I do think there's a, a lot of non-transparency that goes into one-off races. We all know that. Uh, one thing they don't even discuss is the disadvantages of a hen a lot of times. Uh, when you've got 3,000, 5,000, 7,000 birds together, young birds, well, the, they're going to be mating. And the hen's going to be developing eggs at different times. They're going to be releasing the birds on the train. So she's going to have that egg up inside of her while she's trying to come back home from 100 miles. And she's going to have a hard time flying back if she can fly back at all with an egg inside of her. Or she may, uh, any number of egg development or laying the egg the night before or whatever, it's all going to have a huge uh, play on how well she'll be able to home back and forth. Uh, so a hen, if she's in, you know, if she's in the right uh, stage with uh, her body, 
uh, you know, she she could be an outstanding racer, but she's she's gonna have to, you know, it has to be timed right, you know. Anyway, here's here's this little hen, which I love her. I may send her to Taiwan uh, this year because this guy's really a nice man, has a lot of faith and belief in me, and I, I want him to have the very best pigeons. Uh, he's gonna if he gets her, he's getting a good one. She's tight feathered, perfect body, well bred. You know, most of my reds are red to red matings, and that's why I have my reds are have what, light toenails and lighter beaks. If I was mating them back onto the black jean, red jean, black jean, then I would probably have more black flaking in the in the in the uh, colors of them. But when you make red to red for five, six generations, you're going to start getting diluted reds, and you're going to start getting uh, the, the reds like I've got. But I do what I'm going back to what I've said. Earlier, you know, I know what brick reds are because when I when I walk into a loft and I see a hundred of them, I see that that one's darker than the other brick reds. I've got it to compare with. So whereas, whereas you know, if you're you're trying to pick out a bird, somebody's got a brick red, and you've got three of them sitting up there, and you pick out the dark one. I got a hundred of them to look at, and I pick up babies all the time. And anymore, I can you know, I look for our brick reds to have red all the way down through them. And you pull out the wings of reds all the way out to at the end of the of the flight feathers. Reds even coming way back up into the tail, and in the tail, and everything else. I'm getting reds that are becoming more and more almost true reds, velvet all the way through. You, you don't see a lot of that in racing homers, not in the quality racing homers. Here's another Sion Silver, classic Sion again. I don't like if I'm entering a, a, a pigeon race, uh, like a one off race. I don't like sending a, a powder silver. These are lighter colored silvers. I don't like sending a silver to the race because. I don't trust, I, I, I know when you got humans and money mixed up or, or something, I, I just don't trust uh, sending the silver because it sticks out like a sore thumb because about, what, 80, 90% of the birds are blue bars. you got a powder silver sitting in there. Depending on where you're sending it to, which loft, it might be somebody that, that likes that color and spots, you know, if that bird's doing well, that bird might not make it, you know, to the next race. It might, a hawk got it. Uh, another silver. And I'm trying to, I try, the two-legged hawks are a lot worse than, you know, four-legged hawks, three-legged hawks, two-legged hawks, one-legged hawk, whatever kind of hawk to get it. You know what kind of hawks I'm talking about. General, when you get a chance, I want to, I want, I want you to look, these, these three silvers, these are three silver cups, they're identical almost. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a family, and none of these birds are brothers. There's a red like you were talking about. Yeah, he's, Lance is absolutely right. This is a darker red than these two reds are. A little bit darker. See how the red comes out into the wings? It's not just a something, just a little thing that I've been breeding for. A long first become first is not the color. First is performance. But if you can, if you be uh, patient enough to have performance and color, then, then you get to where I'm at. Of course, it only takes a lifetime to do it. This is a darker red. Trying to think what year he is. Uh, that one at the table. <laughs> 2019, so he's going on five years old. And I love this bird. He's a little bit uh, medium, medium, small cock. Really, that's what I, you know, if you're going to fly five and 600 miles, a lot of times that's what you want. I like a medium bird, medium, small bird, particularly a, a hen. Uh, I like a medium, medium, small bird. If you're flying long distance, you know that's what you want to look for with raising pigeons. If you're looking for to buy birds, you want to look for birds that have done well at long distance. All these pigeons can fly 100 miles. They can, they can follow each other back in from 200 miles. You got two to three thousand pigeons flying together. By nature, they're going to fly over, over the year, a million years of evolution with birds. It was one of the ways they. Uh, was able to survive like a group of fish in the ocean and stuff. They're all staying together. Whatever predator is going to hit them, you know, it's going to get some, but most of them's going to get through. And that's one of the reasons the birds all fly together and stay together, even if they're staying. And uh, so, and they're going to fly together as long as they can possibly fly at all. They'll fly together for 100 miles, 150 to them. I don't know what that tells you with a pigeon. It doesn't have a lot to do with their homing instinct. When you get them out five, six, seven hundred miles, then the homing instinct definitely has to kick in because you're not going to have. 2,000 birds coming home together from 600 miles. This is a silver hen. This is this is what I really love. This she's got on the lighter, 
I would call it pearl eye, but the light violet eye. And this this has been very successful for me. This type hen, this lighter colored silver eye. And she comes down from a, a silver cock that I had, 300. Doesn't like being held in that. Well, she's just a little nervous in here right now. That flew 500 miles. He's on the internet, 500 miles six times and 600 miles five times. It's the last bird that I ever had that flew that many miles, uh, that many years. That's, you don't even see anybody nowadays that's got a pigeon that's flown that many miles. Used to, that was pretty common. Uh, you'd have all that walk into a law office and say, yeah, he flew 500 miles six times, or he flew 600 miles five times. Uh, you don't see that too much anymore. I don't know any place you see it anymore. Maybe maybe some of the races out in California or somewhere in Florida. Who the brick red? This ever brick red, he's handled me, handed me. None of them have had any black in them. Another beautiful dark brick red, which is a lot of people love that that brick red. Heisman loved that brick red. I tell you what, if Heisman had one of these brick reds like this, they were hard to get off of him. The darker brick red, especially with the dark eye, it just makes you jump out at you. Classic Ceylons, classic. Uh, in fact, when you went to when you went to Ceylon's loft, the thing that stood out in, in Paul Ceylon's loft when, when Colonel Osmond and Dr. Anderson, which were guys that visited that loft and which wrote about the loft in its time, like somebody going to Fort Boonesboro that visited Daniel Boone and, and talked about Daniel Boone later on. Uh, Draper did that, you know, so you have an idea what happened. This Colonel Osmond and Anderson actually were at Ceylon's loft, and so they wrote about it, and so. That's the information I have, you know, additionally to see on himself. Uh, they talked about the reds and the silvers being the predominant color. You know, he had great blue bars, no two ways about it. But it was the reds and seons that were more associated. Look, see how her red, look at here on the tips of the, these are secondary feathers. See how the red comes on out. And see how she's red all up underneath what I was talking about, a lot of my reds. And I've talked about this in my other videos. See how a hen always has the red up in her tail like that? That's a hen that has that. A cock won't have that. That's a, that's a, a sex link color trait. If you want to come back over here and look at the... A family of Sions again. It's all Sions. Uh, and oddly enough, my reds, most of them, a lot of them go back, go back on old 51. In old 51, uh, 51 on 51, Heisman's great red cock. He was blind bred back to the original pair of Theon that Charles Heisman had. Went back 31 times to that pair. It was 1033 and 1104. Two red checks. And one of them looked almost identical to this hen here. If you look at the, I've got all the old original pictures. Uh, 1104 or 1030, I'm getting the band. Uh, I'm trying to remember which one was the cock and which one was the hen. But the hen, the hen, this looks like. This looks like the hen out of the original. And she was out of a blue bar cock called Leroy. Uh, and Lou Curtis in New York had imported Leroy from Paul Sion, paid him a fortune for the bird. And that Leroy blue bar cock bred more good long distance pigeons in the United States than any pigeon that's ever lived. Uh, they can talk about champions this and champions that. But they could go back years ago and find out, follow down that, that Leroy line, what it did in the United States for a 40 year period of time. Oh, it blows away, quote, what the great pigeons are of today. Uh, there'd be more winners come down out of that bird. And these, these are birds that are down out of that Leroy. As far as I know, I'm the only guy that's got the Leroy blood. I've concentrated on it. Well, we'll, get, we'll start walking to the But to look at the cocks, I'm just trying to show you how much they look alike. This is a family. You know, this was hard complimenting me the other day on, Robbie, you, you've got a true family of birds. You've taken what Charles Heisman did and in 30 years have, in, have advanced that cause. You've taken a great family of pigeons and have made them greater. And I said, you yeah, know, I appreciate you saying that. Uh, that's, that's been my goal. These are birds that look good, but they perform even better. These are five and six hundred milers. Uh, let me watch you. 
Let's start putting back up. We'll, we'll get the loss here just in a second. Here you go. I'll try to hand them to you. You can watch us put them up if you want to. Um, One thing I want to talk about while we're just here, straighten that wing out, um, is ventilation. Somebody got on the internet and I was told, somebody called me and said, there's a guy on the internet right now saying it, it's not important, it's a myth to have good ventilation. I'm like, what? <coughs> uh, this, are you serious? <laughs> Ventil you, don't, you don't need ventilation? Ventilation doesn't mean anything with raising visions? <laughs> you know what? I'll tell you what, uh, if somebody's not paid attention to nature, when you don't pay attention to what's around you, uh, then you might as well go back to bed. Uh, pigeons, if you watch what they do, because I grew up at the end of the urban bridge, that's how I got started with pigeons. I grew up at the end of the bridge, and uh, both my parents were alcoholics. I didn't have no front yard. When you step down the front of our apartment building, you step right out onto the street. If you went out and climbed, walked down the back steps of our place, you stepped right into a thing that wasn't much bigger than this right here. I didn't have anything. But I, I, I didn't feel like I didn't have anything. I, I felt like I was the luckiest guy on earth, and I was. I had a great childhood. But I had the river that was near me. I had the bridge that was near me. And I had the railroad tracks that was near me. So I played on those tracks, and I climbed that bridge, and that's where I wound up getting pigeons. That's how I, I fell in love with them, was watching those birds on those pigeons. I thought to myself when I was a little boy and stare out the window of our apartment and see those, see a bird that's got you know, like a white flight pigeon strutting and cooing around to another pigeon. I was like, oh my God, and that's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And it's, I was fascinated with it. And, uh, I'd be where I'm at with the pins now. You know, I never thought that I'd wind up being who I am with pigeons and having been, I just stayed with the things that I've loved all my life. Pigeons, I started out with pigeons when I was a little boy, and here I am, an old man, still got them, and I've been very successful with them because I stuck with it for going on, you know, 70 years. And same thing with my swimming. I learned to swim down there in the river. And I was. I became a swimmer for Eastern Kentucky University so with 18 All-Americans and then became a scuba diver and I stuck with the water all my life and been very successful for me and then right beside my house we had these fields that got plowed and uh, there was Indian relics in those fields and when they got plowed and I majored in anthropology and got my degree in anthropology and, and that's that's worked very well for me too in a lot of different pursuits that I've been in life having that degree in anthropology so it's I just stuck with all the things. I'm still that same guy that I always was when I was a little boy. Just, I just stayed with it. That's all. That's what I had, and that's that's what I've stayed with. And, and I love to write. You know, I sit in the corner of our, our apartment building, and sit in a chair all the time, and I just write little stories to myself. And and so now I've got that was my seventh book that you've seen. And I've got hopefully in the next two years I'll have two more books come out. Uh, so I love to write, and that, that's who I am. That's what I know. Those those things. And we'll head over to the. To the other pigeon loves. Right at freezing, I think it's like 30 degrees right now. I mean, everybody's toes is getting cold and hands are cold. But we're hanging in there, we're troopers. Listen, uh, I bought five acres of land right here in the middle of town this summer. And the way uh, I had to do it because uh, the person that I had the, the lofts on, his uh, mother in law died, and, and so they did, uh, the family decided to sell some property, and so it changed the whole. Uh, complex of, of everything that was going on so I had to find a place to move the lofts to if I wanted to keep pigeons it was a big decision in my life because you know in the mid 70s uh, you had to make a decision am I going to continue to do this but I, I am who I am I, I, there's no way I could get out of pigeons I, I was born with them and, I, and I'll die with the birds uh, and, and I've got to keep the sea on the strand I feel like an allegiance uh, like the flag bearer the, uh, the one guy that is, is truly uh, keeps these sea actually out in the, in the limelight 
actually racing, not just talking about them. We're talking about what they did 20 or 40 years ago, but flying them right now today. So anyways, one of the things that I did is I bought two containers, had them brought down from Ohio. Containers, I mean those cargo containers that you see on the back of 18-wheel trucks, and they come in different sizes, and the ones I got were 45 foot long and about 10 foot tall, nine and a half feet. This is one of them here, and Jeremy, the guy shooting the video, he and his brother did a did all the work. We had to come in with heavy equipment and great offs on the land so we could set the lofts there. We had to measure everything. It was all a lot of logistical, a lot of expense, and a lot of time. When I got back from Florida, we started immediately on the project. Um, and, you know, today's January. Uh, we went all of August and all of September and all of October. We went three straight months just going at it like mad men. The three of us primarily, but there was other people involved as well. And, uh, and, and I'm glad to be at this point. I'll, I'll take these lofts, you know, it was in, in different phases. The first phase was to buy the land. The second phase was to develop the land. Third phase was to, to buy the containers and bring them down out of Ohio and have them brought in here. I, the 18 wheel trucks wouldn't deliver them. I had to get a record service to come in and, and bring the lofts on up into me. I bought some of the old lofts that I had off of John. I brought those back in and I, I worked on those. Uh, refitting them and customizing them again and getting them back up in good condition. And then the fourth phase was to actually bring the birds and put them into it and start doing that kind of work and getting the birds settled into them. And then the fifth phase will come on later on this uh, spring and summer when I start doing landscaping work and, you know, beautifying the area and making it a lot more uh, appealing in every way. So I'm at the end of about the fourth phase of, of this job. So this room here, we put in, it's called the catch room because of these containers had large doors on them in order to open the doors anybody you have to be you have to open them up you know a certain way and these 10 foot tall doors open up and if there's any bird that could possibly fly out i also wanted to have a catch room not only did i catch anything that flies out in this room which is something that charles heisman really believed in was having rooms like this attached onto every pigeon loft that you had so that any bird that started to fly out you you had control of catching that bird he had it on all his he had 41 lofts most of them were military lofts, but he had a little bit of rooms that were on the doors. If the bird flew out of that room, it flew into that room. This is a big one. And we built a we built a trap door here. Jeremy's brother put this on here so that later later on, if I start to fly a bird out here, they can actually come in here and I'll have this open and the birds can, can come on in. I can catch the birds coming in and I can catch any birds that come out. So it's a it's a great little room to have. Uh, I love the room. It, it works it works fine for and all pigeon guys know what I'm talking about. It's a, good room. it's a little bit bigger than most of them are. Come on in, we'll, we're gonna look, I've got in here, in this particular container, uh, I'm gonna talk about a whole lot of different things here, but we're gonna talk, it's a 45 foot long loft, t basically 10 foot tall. We open the doors. I've got two pair of reds right now on eggs, and below freezing, so I don't wanna scare them off the bed. Stand right here for a minute. I want you to see. Come on in. Let me hit it just for a second. This is the finest group of red sea arms that have ever existed. Period. These are all five, six hundred mile birds. Gorgeous brick reds. If they didn't fly five or six hundred miles, then their parents did, and probably all four grandparents. And this is the dead winter, early in January. I want you to see what an Avery we've got here. This Avery is bigger than most people's loss. It's two dog kennels that have been built put together by Jeremy and his brother. Uh, the birds love it. They have to come in and shut the door. There you go. I'm going to try to get walk out here. I'll talk to you more about this table here in a second. I'm just showing the birds off right now. If y'all come around this side of it, come on this side so the birds will be able to come around. You want to see some beautiful red, brick red? This is it. I seem a little bit, a little bit nervous right now with three guys in the loft this time of the day. When I'm out here by myself, 
I can just about pick them up off the off the Twelve of these birds are going to Taiwan in the spring. Any uh, bird you see with a bright green uh, band on it was last year's bird. That hen right there with that hook left leg is one of my best breeders. A Cooper Hawk caught her and uh, I thought she would completely lose the leg leg about dead, but oh man, she raises so quickly. So that's a beautiful leg. Normally I can come out here in the loft on the outside and just visit it. And the bird will all come out to the other way If Hoffman was alive, I know he'd be proud of these birds. If Paul Peon was alive, I know he'd be proud of these birds. So that's a good thought. Lance is feeding the birds right now. That's his job a lot of times. Decided to take the dead middle of the container. Here you can be. I decided to take the, the center section. Lance and I drew out a long 45 foot long, so I came out and I cut out the middle, basically the middle 22 feet or whatever it was. Had it cut out from, had to come up a foot or so, and it come down a foot or so so that it would match up with the dog kit. We cut out a big hole in the container. In other words, we opened this thing up. So isn't that container going to get hot? This is the last thing that's going to get hot. This has got more air in it. This is like, this is kind of a shelter more than it is a log. This is what pigeons love. Too many people are monkey see, monkey do in the pigeon sport. I said, they repeat what they hear. They go to loft just like the other guy did. They very rarely think on their own. Uh, this is a, was a, a dream loft. So I'll build a loft that I knew what the pigeons love. I knew from being a little boy catching pigeons on the bridge and Cold Temple and up in silos and barns. I know what birds like out of nature. They love being able to have the open air and they wanted a, a sense of security, but always also had one the sense of being able to get them. My birds are extremely tame. I don't have to go out there and pick up those pigeons every 15 seconds when I'm in the loft to know that it's a good bird. Or I can see it's a good bird. I can see it's healthy. I don't have to pick it up. I built these nests up here. They love being up there. Pigeons love when you don't have to pick them up. Or they think they can get away from them. They don't like that. That's what the pigeons like. That's not what you like. That's not what the loft guys like. But that's what the birds like. And if you want birds to be great, healthy pigeons like these birds and sparkling with health, then you want your birds to be happy. And to make birds happy, you do what the birds want to do, not what you want to do. So I, I'm a, a strong advocate of having happy pigeons. Happy pigeons make healthy pigeons. If you've got pigeons that have got superior health, then you're in the advantage over the other people. There's one red hen out there that got hit hard by a hawk over the middle wall. Yeah, that's her. But that, you know, that place that tore it on her neck. He about pulled her through the she was lucky she even lived. But I, I kept her. She'll still breed all that and she looks like her. She looks terrible. I know that. Uh, but that's a Cooper Hawks. Did that to her. Um, she was lucky she even lived through it. Uh, and I've got a one that's the first young bird I ever raised in the loft right over there. She hatched out. Uh, 
dog, I don't know, six weeks ago when I first moved the birds into the lot. You see this little green band on the beautiful little end. And uh, the great thing about this loft is that in the spring and in the summer, all this leaves out in front of you, all these trees. I've got a big wide creek down there on the bottom down there. I don't know, it's just throughout the country. Um, it's a rural city, and yet you're right in the middle of town. I'm uh, one and a half, two minutes from my house. I can be back and forth. How, how can you be out in the country and be in the city at the same time? So this was a perfect place for me to have these pigeons. When I first built these, uh, put these dog kennels out here, I thought it was great, and it was great. But it didn't take me long to see it. So I had Cooper hawks that were flying down out of the woods and grabbing these birds through these uh, through these Avery's. So I started wrapping the Avery's again with wire, and I wrapped them again with wire. And after about the third and even the fourth layer of different kinds of wire, I've not had a single Cooper hawk that's been able. They come in here and sit up here and, and lick their chops. You know, wanting to, wanting to get one of them. I've not had a single bird that's been hit by a hawk since I put the fourth layer of wire on there. It's been enough to bounce them off and be able to keep them, get their talons through the through there. Uh, you'll see over in the far left corner, that's Jim. Over there, he's the lighter red chick cock, and you'll see he's got a little black in him. Jim happens to be out of a, out of a 500 mile cockler, blue bar cock. And uh, in, a, in a red hen. Most of these reds are all out of red, red ladies, but Jim's out of the blue bar and a red. And that's Jim's daughter that I, that I had earlier that I showed you that Lance brought back over and let loose the rock. I'll pick her out. She's a little different color now. Where is she? There's Jim. Jim's out of the blue bar. But this is what I was talking about comparing red color. See, I've got a lot of reds to compare here. You can see, I've got a, a lot of them are kind of the same red. Like, look at how beautiful that red is over there. Can you zoom in on that red over there? Look, just look how deep red that is. You know, there's been some uh, families and, and strains of racing pigeons that have had red in them. Uh, Trenton comes to mind where they had some brick reds like that. But the, uh, the Trentons that I always saw, none of them handled or looked like these birds. And, uh, and the, I'm not sure if I pronounce that strain correctly, the mulums or mulumums or whatever, how that, you see some reds in that. Uh, but I, uh, mulumums, or I would say I'm not around anybody that's got them, I just see that. So I don't know how to correctly pronounce it. It's funny too because you would not believe how many people mispronounce the word sion. Uh, sion, they call them sion, they call them, they call them a lot of different things other than the word sion. Right now, some of the birds don't look because it's cold and the sky's drifting. You see how pigeons are puffed up a little bit with the cold. But these are, these are really gorgeous, nice reds right now. It's just really cold. I mean, it's, it's freezing. So they're they're doing what birds do. You know, they're, they're puffing up a little bit. Oh, there's Jim's daughter. The one I couldn't see right there. That's her. Come on in. On this side, I've got silvers. A few blue bars in here. Most of the blue bars in here are this year's birds. I've got a man in California, I think mean, Mike Clements, that uh, it, it, I owe him a, 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 a lot of old birds and a good group of young bird blue bars too. I sent some to him. Uh, he, got, he got hurt in transit. That uh, broke his heart and that broke my heart too. But, not to worry, I'm getting him, he's going to get his birds. And uh, so uh, that's on, that weighs on me. Uh, I've got to get him his pigeons. But these birds love this loft. I'll tell him to be, well, he's pure winter and work his birds to come back to the All right, come over here and stand right here. Yeah. Stand right there. Let me, let me, let me. I like one of the things that pigeon guys do on their shooting videos. They, they zoom around too much. Again, where are you going to see Sion's like this? Or 
we're not talking about shell burns, and we're not talking about trash burns. We're talking about high quality, long distance, pure Xeon, great family. Most distinguished family of racing tools, probably that's ever existed. Period. If they're not, then which family is it? This family has the history that the Xeons have. These birds, in this law, with this kind of ventilation, have a extra uh, sparkle to them. That's one word I'll use. There's a couple of young birds in here, real cute or late half birds. I think it's four of them. And uh, four silver. So when they're, when they're in this, this much open air and they've got this kind of stuff to fly around in, we're going to have happy, healthy pigeons. One of the things we did with the loft, I came up with, we knew we were on the hillside, so how were we going to handle this Avery? So what we did, I had a, I had a friend from Cuba who had been locked up in Guantanamo Bay, David Fuente, locked up in Guantanamo Bay twice. He owned the Cuba Body Shop in Lexington, Kentucky. Super nice person. I love him to death. I said, David, I've got to get somebody that can cut that container and cut those walls out. I don't know how to go about cutting that metal. He said, I do it. He said, no sweat from Richmond, Kentucky. I be over there. And he called me back up in a little while. I had it marked up. He said, I, I'm done. I said, done. He said, yes. And I came out. And sure enough, he had made the cuts exactly. He made a cut on these containers because they're grooved. You'll see how he cut so that I could bend the, the wall of the container over and use it for a floor, partially part of the floor of the Avery itself. So this is the wall of the container is now the floor of the Avery, part of the floor. Out here I've got, uh, we've got a double wire and also a grate out there for, you know, for the birds to, to walk on the be. This worked out very well. The, the birds love it. It's just taking, you know, I say this coming year, it takes a little bit of time. But the moment I let those birds loose in this loft, I swear, you can almost see them smile. Uh, as much as, you know, you've been around pigeons, you know when they're happy. And I knew the day that I put them in here, I, I, I was happy to see them that happy. Just the way they looked around and, 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 and loved this open loft like this. Stand here. They love this this side of the loft. Lance, come over here. They love, Lance has talked about this. They love this side of the loft, you know, just better than they did that side, for whatever reason. They, 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 the bird, when they start, one, one pair of hands is right here just about as quick as I put them in. And they love this high ceilings. They do love the high ceilings. I highly recommend you. Know, oh, you can't catch the bird. So what? You've got to catch the bird, you know, catch it at night with a ladder or something. I don't have to catch the bird. I don't have to catch the bird for it. Put the band so, on the baby. So the birds like this. I might, you might not like it, but it's the birds that are important. And if you can listen to what the birds are saying, they say this is the loft we want. And that's that's what they've got. You're not going to find healthier pigeons. There's no bird in here that's the slightest bit sick. I don't give these birds any medication. 
In fact, we get water out of the creek a lot of times. I never give them any of that. I call it crap. I never give them any injections of this, a shot of that, and this and that. We're going to Superman medicine and all that, all that stuff. You got healthy pigeons. I've selectively kept healthy pigeons all my life. You're going to raise healthy pigeons, you know. Um, it's worked for me and, and, and keeping them happy, you know. I don't even, I don't feed them super, super feed or anything else. Give them grit. I do believe uh, the bird gets down a little bit. You could give them to put a little apple cider vinegar in their water. Mm -hmm. I believe in, it doesn't hurt the worms or birds a little bit. I believe in giving them red grit. A pecking stone's good. Um, even grinding up a little uh, cabbage every now and then and giving that to them. Uh, it doesn't hurt to give them a cod liver oil capsule. Um, these birds and fish are actually related to each other. You know, I, I like to smile when people talk about eye sign. I don't know how many people have ever looked at fish's eyes or lizard's eyes. A lot of them got eye sign. But I guess they're I want to do another thing for you. Hold it. He's still shooting. He's still shooting. I want to keep going there and work the birds. Go over this way. I want to get them coming here. I want most of them coming here where we can stand inside here. Let's move it all I'm very, very proud of these right Let me get this. You stand right there. You stand. Most of y'all block this area. I want, I want people to see these rays. Exactly right. Here's the difference. 
This is a, one of the new lofts. Jeremy and his brother built this downward here. We did what we could to separate the two rooms. Got it over here. The reds are on one side and the silver is on the other side. Pretty, pretty simple setup. Absolutely. This loft has probably the most ventilation of any loft you could possibly ever dream of having. Uh, and I, I really believe. You know, I don't know of any doctor that said, oh, you're not feeling good, you need to go to some room and lock yourself up in a closet. You know, I see, I've been in lofts where people have, uh, uh, I've been in enclosed lofts in rooms that don't have much ventilation. And there's a sadness on those pigeons' faces. And, uh, and, they're, and they're lethargic looking and, a, and a odd looking on their, their feather even. I, one example I'll give you is that I scuba dive all the time. And as a scuba diver, I see fish. I see everything. I see uh, scorpion fish. I see snappers, grunts, groupers. You know, I see sergeant majors and pork fish and every kind of fish that there is out there. And I see them all the time. And I take pictures of them. And, and those fish are moving around real quick. They're, they're watching each other and everything. And I've also been to sea aquariums. And when I go to a sea aquarium, even the best ones, you go there, it could be a 20 million sea aquarium. Now, oh, I got the great fish, I got sharks, and I've got those same snappers, and I've got this and that in there. And you go to a sea aquarium, if you've ever done any scuba diving or snorkeling, and you know what those fish look like in the wild, out in that fresh open water, versus what you see in those sea aquariums, those fish that are in the sea aquarium are like, oh, let me hit my own sea aquarium. They look like they're about ready to die. They've got like a, I don't know, they look like a, they don't look nothing like those fish do out in the ocean. And, and only a person that's been in both worlds realize that. If you've never been out in the ocean and dive, then I guess when you go to a, a sea aquarium, you think, oh, that's a really cool fish. But when I see one of those fish, I mean, he looks like a really sick fish to me. He looks like he's on his death's bed. And they are. They're not happy. They're not, they're not who they are. And uh, that's the same thing with these pigeons. These pigeons are getting to be who they are. They're out in the open. They're the fish out in the wild. And that's why they have that zeal to them, that vim and vigor, uh, that, that health, because they're in a loft they love, not a loft that the pigeon people love. This is not a monkey see, monkey do loft. And so I laugh at anybody that says that ventilation isn't good for a pigeon. They have to have peace of their brains. Come on in. This loft is one of my old lofts. Love it. John built this loft out of barn wood, and I've been working on it, trying to get it back up. I've got a lot of work yet to still do on it. Still come off the nest and I hate you in there. Um, these are all my blue bars, my Leroy stuff. Let's come on out here. Basically, let, let me hit it just for a second. Again, I want to stress this is a family of pigeons. It is in a family of pigeons where you find success. Not the opposite of They're eating right now when they get. I've got pine needles down on the floor right now. You know, it's January. One thing, and I've talked about this in another video. This time of year, a lot of guys are trying to raise an early hatch. If you want to raise early hatches, you know, you want to put your birds together right around Thanksgiving or maybe even a week before Thanksgiving. And by the time they come together and by the time they lay their eggs and by the time 18 days goes by and time those babies get, you know, 10 days old or whatever, you'll have your bands issued to you about then and you can get bands on those birds that are right around 1st of January, you know, 
last week of each end, earliest as you could possibly ever get the, uh, you know, birds banded. And so you get those super early hatches, but you may have a bird that's a one, two months older than some other bird that's in the same competition. And uh, I believe that an early hatch probably does have an advantage uh, in maturity. Racehorse people certainly believe that. Uh, but I think a lot of times March and April hatch birds fly just about as good as the January and February birds. And it's certainly, I don't know, it's easier to raise pigeons when the weather's warmer. Uh, it seems like I get some of my healthiest birds uh, a lot of times right in the middle of summer, even, even in late summer. Uh, when it's really, you know, 85, 90 degrees outside all day long, uh, it seems like those babies just about raise themselves. They sit that down. Here, Lance, work those other few out into the Avery if you can. And we're going to walk them out here in this Avery. Leave those over a little bit. That bird came off her head. I don't like that. Here, come on. That's one of my favorite blue bars right here. This is one of my favorite birds. He's at a, he, his daddy was called my favorite. You'll see him on the internet. Gorgeous pigeon. A little lighter blue than the others. A beautiful, brilliant eye on him. Uh, like being, I'm not getting into the eye sign. I'm just talking about it just as overall appearance. Let's check the other color that we got over. She's gorgeous. We'll walk in here to Avery for a minute. Come on. This is where we're all at. Oh, man. Let's come here and block them off a little bit. Too. Here, here show his eye again if you can. He's just a real typical one of them. This is an eye that Heisman looked for. I just call it that red, orange, yellow eye. You know, without getting into eye sign. But that was very typical of what Charles Heisman bred for. He's a little lighter blue. Again, like when you all talk about comparisons of colors, you really don't know what, if you've got a lighter blue until you've got a big bunch of blue. You don't know if you've got a darker red until you've got a bunch of darker reds. You don't know if you've got a bird that's got the most perfect lace pattern on it until you've got a hundred other lace pattern birds out in front of it. And then you say, oh my, yeah. See a little hen right there? I don't, I don't want to bring them up right now. I've got a I got a hand right, right there. It's got that little place on the head. That's, a, that's a summertime sister. Excellent breed. There's a bird of flu in Africa. That's Lance's. That's, a, uh, that's Lance's uh, son. This bird with the red band. Lance the pigeon. True family of pigeons, racing pigeons, seons. This is the best family of seons that's ever existed, in my humble opinion. In mine too. And I'm sure there's a, probably some people out there maybe be saying, oh, listen to him talk. You know, I'll let you judge for yourself. You know, I've taken over 15 the Sions in my lifetime with this family of Sions. When I went to the National Yellowbird Show this year to buy equipment for the wife, for the wife. I had four different fanciers come up to me and tell me that they were winning with my pigeons. One guy told me he won uh, four races out of eight race, young bird races this year uh, with my birds. Uh, there's a doctor in Pennsylvania, Derek Brown. Uh, his club told him, oh, you, oh, no, no. Uh, he said that, uh, they told him this club that all those Sions, them those slow birds, they can't win. And uh, he won the first race. 
and I think later on won another race. And he's been having a good time out of that. Um, I flew birds up. Walked up in the Indiana. That group up there told him, all them Sions, they're no good. Uh, it's like the 150 mile race. Of course, he, he beat everybody with my Sion on that race. Yeah, it's, so, it's so typical uh, of what I hear over and over again uh, about what people say. You know, they just they pass on this monkey, uh, monkey in, in the feeding game. Somebody says something, it becomes a truth if it's said enough by enough people. Nobody calls them to do any research or experiments. You know, I will say this too about the family of birds. Uh, when you look in these one-loft races, that's one of these crosses that won that race. Well, hell, no wonder it cross won the damn race because they're 99.99% of them were crosses to start out with. Do you think for one second that if half the birds were from a family, from this very family right here, we'll just say they're the any one of the Victoria Falls or the Hoosier race, and if 50% of them were from this family of pigeons right here, versus the 50% of crosses, the very best crosses you can come up with, what do you think would be the percentage of birds that would win? The crosses or the family? I can tell you right now what would win. It'd be this family. They would destroy the crosses if they had an equal number. That's something nobody ever talks about that takes into consideration that one thing, making it equal. Yeah, that's the reason. You know, any time that I enter any of these uh, races, I'm about the only guy that's got a, a pure family of birds. So I'm going up against, you know, a thousand to one. If you stop and give that a thought, you know, what if half of them were in the family? Then, then what would people say? Yeah, that would rapidly change all the discussion. Selling families of birds, so that's not what you're going to see. They're into selling crosses. They're into selling. The newest car comes out on the car lot. With a family, you'll get birds of basically the same universal type, same kind of head, same kind of face, same kind of uh, basic color patterns, same basic size. Uh, same, you know, same temperament, same quality of feather. There'll be variations. Came off right. She's going to get in here. Got on there. Get back on there. Got one here. Hey, you're going to walk. Yeah. Got you got back on, coach. That'd be close today. You're going to cover all your material, huh? This loft here is another one of my lofts. I'm not going in it right now. I've got uh, twill whites in there and two late hash blue bars. All these whites are going to a uh, a guy down in Florida, uh, Steve Holder, um, he's going to start using those spots to lease at military funerals. Uh, Steve's a very nice person, and uh, I, I won't have any white pigeons at all ever again anymore. Uh, I kept them mostly as hawk bait, and as, as, uh, uh, I did train them, had them out to 200 miles, and I even had two whites that fly back from 1,000 miles. Uh, which I never dreamed that would happen, but they did. They flew back from Key West. And, uh, but I'm not keeping whites anymore. I, I'm going to fly young birds out of this loft this coming year. Uh, I can put about 60 birds in this loft uh, and fly them out of there. I, I had hawks. I had, when I first put this up, I had hawks hitting this Avery. I must have had seven or eight young birds killed before I finally put like a fourth layer of wire around it. But I haven't had any trouble since then. It's a good young bird loft to fly out of.
So that's what I'm going to be doing with this one. Yeah, right now I'm real lucky I'm getting water out of this. Uh, you can see we're just doing doing this routine. Uh, but we'll later on, uh, I'm having the water lines brought in. So I'm going to, first time in many years I'm going to have water running into the loft. And I'm going to have electricity running into the loft. I'm going to be putting shrubs and trees all around the loft and building stairways and staircases. You know, a lot of stuff. I'm just popping these ones off. There you go, buddy. Top of the day. Can you shine it? Look at them, they're coming out. Oh, yeah. Finally not frozen. I want to, is it still on? Let me hit just for a second. I want to get a picture of Jeremy and Liz. This is Jeremy. Yeah, the guy that does all the videos. Crew. <laughs> Jeremy's been an awful good friend to me over the years. We work together. We haven't missed a day now. About 75 days. We're working 10 or days, 70, 70 days straight. We're starting to go a little bit stir crazy. But it's okay. We're going to stir crazy together. I want to show how the Avery's look like. See, this is the catch room. Uh, I've still got, I don't know, I've still got dress up work to do on the loft. I know that, but you know, I've just made this big move up here. Show you what the Avery's look like from this side. One of the things that, uh, that I really liked and was impressed by when I went up to see uh, Jim at the Hoosier Loft, you know, and one of my Sions, again from a family of Sions, my family, no Smith Sions, I had a strawberry melee up there on the race before the fire that finished uh, 13th. I think it was on the 150. Uh, so again, whoever says that those birds you know, these people don't remember that. Yeah, they're going to hear anything in the sport. And then I had a guy from Hawaii this year that on the race before the biggest race, the final one, I think he had one of my, two of my Sions uh, finished, uh, I don't know, one of them was 22nd or something. And then another, the big the big Andy's loft or big, a big Al's loft or something down in uh, Florida. I had another guy that uh, wrote to me and said that he had it sent four burns down there, and three of them finished that race in in, uh, in good shape. One of them, had, one of them, never even, I think it something happened to it on the in the training time, the early training time. But all three of the other birds that he had went all through the, the race series, and they finished all three of them finished very well in, the, in that big Andy's race down there, or big big Al one of them. Uh, I just get tired of listening to people say say anything to sell a bird. Uh, these are fantastic seals, and they'll fly very well against the best birds in the world. Uh, and you can see what they look like. So, uh, in the springtime, I'm going to open up this field here. I own all this land. It goes up through here for five acres. And we could walk it all out, but it's it's a big open open field. Goes down to a creek in the woods right here, and uh, I'm going to open this up down here where we'll have this where we have a big area to walk down to the creek in. It's real pretty here uh, through most of the year. All the leaves are off the tree right now as we're in dead winter. So I'm going to shut the container down. That's it, I guess. Pretty much. Right, you got to tell them to like and subscribe. Oh yeah, if you, if you like this video, subscribe. You know, it'll inspire them to make many more. Oh I, I, yeah, listen, that's another thing too. There's there's some guys out there right now that are making a pigeon video every 15 seconds. You know, I guess they're using that same mentality that some of these insurance companies use. You know, get that name recognition. You know, 
uh, whatever you, the insurance company is, it comes on television for, you know, the important thing is not whether a dog said it or a monkey said it or a, or a grasshopper said it, just that you remember that name. And there's some of these guys coming on the internet right now, it seems like every day they've got a new pigeon video. You know, well, you know I, I've got a new idea about pigeons, and I'm going to tell you this story about pigeons, and look at this pigeon, and I don't know this, but the whole thing is they're trying to sell you a pigeon. And that, that's what that's all about. And uh, so, word of the wise, you know, think about it. Why, why would anybody come on the Internet every day and tell you that they're an expert and that uh, this is what you've got to do to be successful or this is how easy things can be if you get my pigeons? And don't buy that other guy's birds. Make sure you get mine. Uh,